Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Erica Rincon. I am with the organization Policy Link. We are a national research and action institute dedicated to advancing equity for low income communities and communities of color. Uh, this is the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color webinar on opportunity youth perspectives on policy and practice. And I want to extend a huge thank you to all of you for joining us this morning and this afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color has been hosting as part of our community of practice work that is meant to foster learning and action on issues impacting boys and young men of color. And uh, given that this specific population, um, BMOC, uh, comprises a disproportionate number of opportunity youth, we know that this topic is especially important for our networks and for our communities. Um, so to briefly go over the agenda today, I'm going to run through some very quick housekeeping items. I'm then going to give a very brief overview of the Alliance. Uh, following uh, that, we'll just spend a couple minutes um, sharing out what, what, what we'll be talking about today, and then I will be handing it off to our amazing lineup of speakers who will be providing presentations. Um, and then following that, we'll be able to engage in some of the questions that you have for the panelists um, and have a little bit of discussion. So some general housekeeping items. Given the large number of folks on the line, you, you are all muted. However, at any point throughout the webinar, you are able to submit your questions into our question box you'll see that picture there on the PowerPoint. So please, please submit these questions. We're going to do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Um, so we, we definitely want to encourage you to do that. And then also we want to let you know that the recording and presentations uh, from this webinar will be made available to you within 24 hours. Next slide. All right, so I just wanted to provide some very brief background on the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. We are a statewide coalition in California comprised of community organizations and youth leaders and um, systems leaders and philanthropy and other change agents that are working to improve outcomes for boys and young men of color in the areas of education, employment, safety and justice, um, and health. And our work rests on four primary strategies. The first one is local and state level policy advocacy. Um, the second one is um, our sort of direct youth engagement and youth leadership development. We also do work around communications uh, messaging and framing on boys and young men of color. And then we also have our community of practice that this webinar series is a part of. And next slide. So today, we're really, really excited to hear from the following folks on efforts that are happening in California and across the country on, um, you know, ensuring that opportunity youth are on a pathway to success. So we're going to be hearing from Dr. Prince White with the Urban Peace Movement, Ernie Silva with SciaTech, Sada Matthew with the Forum for Youth Investment, and Andrew Moore with the National League of Cities. Um, and we know that um, you know youth of color comprise a majority of opportunity youth, and our presentations are going to get into breaking down some of that data. So I won't go through that um, right now, but I, I did want to just state this at the outset so that you can have this in mind, given the demographic shifts that have long been underway across our country. Um, People of color now comprise close to a majority of our youth under the age of 18 um, years old in the U.S. And in many regions and states, this number is far greater than the majority. For example, in California, 73% of our young folks are people of color and several other states that um, have a majority youth of color uh, population among their young folks include uh, New York, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Florida, Maryland, Nevada, and other, and there are other states that are very close behind, including uh, Louisiana and Illinois. So in recognizing this, it becomes clear, obviously, that the success of our future workforce, that the success of our nation as a whole, obviously then rests on the ability of our systems to invest meaningfully in this population. And I know that many of us are still very much grappling with the atrocities that were committed over the weekend in Charlottesville. And I think that serves as a reminder that 
it's now more important than ever to continue to push strongly for an agenda that keeps our folks, our young people safe, that keeps them out of the justice system, and that connects them to opportunity. So today, you are going to learn about some of the strongest, most effective programs and innovative strategies that organizations and city and community leaders are are implementing across the country to improve outcomes for opportunity youth. You'll also get to hear about what is needed to really strengthen and grow this work at a larger level and what are the strategies we need to bring about greater systems-wide change that affects much larger populations of, of opportunity youth. So with that, I want to send a very big thank you to our wonderful lineup of speakers. We're really, really excited to hear from you today. And with that, we're going to kick it off with our first presenter, um, Dr. Prince White. He is a campaign coordinator and determination facilitator at the Urban Peace Movement, an organization based in Oakland, California, that builds youth leadership to transform the culture and social conditions that lead to community violence and mass incarceration in communities of color. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Prince. Next slide. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for having me, and thank you to the organizers of the webinar. I, this is a, an, an issue that is very important to me and to my organization. Uh, as I tell the young men that are in my Determination Black Men's group, uh, you know, I tell them that your focus determines your reality. And when we have a focus on these young people, these opportunity youth, you know, it's really going to have a big impact, uh, really, on our whole society. Like, these youth are the key. Uh, to really uh, paving the way and, um, you know, changing the systems that have been so ineffective for such a long time. So, uh, you know, opportunity youth, as we understand it, are individuals who are between 16 and 24 who are not in school and they don't have jobs. They're not participating in the labor market. Uh, I facilitate the Determination Black Men's Group, which is for 16 to 24 year olds. Uh, uh, a lot of the young men that are in my group are formerly incarcerated, their systems impacted, they've been impacted by violence, or they've been in my foster homes like I have been. And, um, you know, we're a brotherhood and healing circle, you know, that the goal is to provide support and, and healing for young men who've been in a lot of trauma, who've uh, experienced a lot of, uh, you know, negative uh, situations in their lifetimes and many of which are opportunity youth that don't have jobs and don't have uh, education or not plugged into education. And our goal is to try to get them support and get them plugged in. Because overall, we're looking to reduce uh, violence and mass incarceration in our communities. And opportunity youth are, are a big part of that. It's important the way we talk about uh, uh, these youth and the fact that we use opportunity youth to even begin with. I've been doing this work for a couple of years now. And I know that folks are very familiar with the term at-risk youth. You know, it's something that sometimes we have to say, look at this is who I work with. But it's a very like negative kind of connotation to it. Sometimes people have talked about disconnected uh, youth uh, uh, referring to the same population. And I think opportunity youth really uh, is an important place. Like I said, how we focus, how we talk, uh, uh, how we look at these youth uh, uh, and how they look at themselves is an important part of their pathways forward. What I'm going to do for you today is really just, uh, I have a short presentation to tell you uh, uh, really uh, two things. And that uh, opportunity youth and, and focusing on their issues is a big part of fighting mass incarceration and racial inequality in our societies. And uh, I want you all to really understand that this is not just a couple of bad seeds. These are not just some bad individuals that we're talking about, but this is a systemic issue and uh, the youth, the opportunity youth themselves are a part of changing these uh, uh, policies and the systems that have led to these failures. Um, <clears throat> let me look at the next slide. I'm gonna tell you about the context of the work that I do here in Oakland. Uh, I'm gonna tell you specifically about my group and some of the kind of campaigns that we work on that we have to uh, the youth lead. Uh, the context here in, in in Oakland and when in, is one in which we have like 21,000 opportunity youth, uh, uh, many of which uh, over 2,000, close to 10% are in foster homes or wards of the state that go directly into the prison system. Uh, opportunity youth are so important because as we say, you know, uh, nothing stops a bullet faster uh, than a job. And, uh, you know, we know that part of decreasing this uh, mass incarceration where they're spending uh, 75,000 a year uh, to, to incarcerate a, a person 
is uh, just not a system that works. But when we take a look at it, we see that even from the get-go, black boys here in Oakland are, from, are, are, are operating from behind. We see that it's impacted their health. We see lower birth rates. We see lower immunization rates uh, uh, with our, our black boys. We see higher uh, rates of asthma, even at kindergarten. If we look at the next slide, we're able to really see that uh, with the school experiences, uh, black boys, and this is up to eight years old, this is from our partners at the Urban Strategies Council. We are part of the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color. And you know we work together to get this data and to find, uh, uh, to, to find policies and push policies that are really gonna impact these youth. But when we see the situation that they're coming from, where so many uh, uh, children, black children are missing school, uh, especially in comparison to their white counterparts. Their literacy rates are down, chronically absent. If we look at the next slide, we see the impact that trauma and violence has on these young youth, uh, on these youth, um, and we see the rates of it. Uh, uh, they're being suspended by the third grade, one in 11, and then we see that half of black males in the fifth grade have lost at least one family member because of violence. Um, a third have experienced two or more such deaths. We have a saying in restorative justice circles in this community that hurt people hurt people. Um, and here, you know, it's just very plain to see from an early age that the, the, the situation, the context is not very good for them. These are not these youth fault. This is not them. This is the system that they're coming into. If we look at the next slide, uh, I have for you a picture of the group that I, that I run, the Termination Black Men's Group. Like I said, it's a brotherhood and healing circle um, and I really think it's the key. Urban Peace Movement, we have what you call is a healing-centered organizing model where we believe that, you know, providing a safe space for these young men, a healing space for these young men, and engaging them in civics and culture is, um, you know, a real big part of the solution. Uh, this is a part of engaging. Some folks do opportunity youth. They build houses. They take the youth. They teach them trades. They build them houses. They, they learn how to build houses. They learn how to do cars. There's so many different ways to engage youth. And our specific way to engage them is to teach them about media and provide them media skills and teach them about social justice organizing and actually engage them in campaigns. One of uh, such campaign that we're right in the middle of, we're going to have a big uh, rally and demonstration on the 17th here in, in, in Oakland, is for Dejon Ford, a youth who is charged as an adult at the age of 17. And he's been waiting for a uh, trial in Santa Rita jail for almost uh, four years now, and we're looking to bring him home or at least get him transferred to juvenile court. And our youth went out there and um, really pressed, uh, the, the pressed people and gotten petitions, got signatures that spread the, the, the word, have uh, written songs, have, have, have thrown rallies and engaged people about this issue. And um, like I said, I really think it's the key to, to uh, getting them back on track and, and changing the whole system. You know, I think we can definitely change some individuals, but we can change the whole systems by having them out there leading it and uh, learning about these campaigns. If we look to the next slide here, it's part of the work I do with all my partners in the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color, but specifically in the Justice Reinvestment Coalition in Alameda County. Uh, we got together a 1400 jobs program, which is for formerly incarcerated people and opportunity youth. That's what we pressed for. That's what we campaigned for. We said, hey, look, we want to get these opportunity youth uh, access to jobs uh, uh, because we know that this is a, a vulnerable population. Um, and, you know, we ultimately we uh, campaigned our board of supervisors and ultimately it became, uh, uh, it did get past 5-0 and it became a campaign, it became a program, a reentry hiring program specifically for formerly incarcerated people but still we were able to uplift our issues and a lot of folks who are opportunity youth, and specifically high opportunity youth, those who are impacted by the criminal justice system are gonna be able to have access to these jobs. But throughout this whole process, we were able to engage our youth, we were able to bring them to uh, uh, positions of leadership and uh, really uh, uplift their voices and uplift their concerns in our community. And, um, you know, this is a specific uh, style of, of, of engaging opportunity youth. Because like I said, sometimes we just we engage them in trades. Sometimes it's about uh, 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 very specific uh, pathways to careers and to education. And uh, this is our specific one. 
and uh, I think it's uh, particularly effective and um, I'm looking forward to questions and to engaging you all about it more further. Uh, the comrades that are coming after me are going to help put this into a, a broader state and a national context. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prince. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to hear about the work that you all are doing to really directly engage youth and make sure that they are at the forefront of the policy change work and that they're driving it and leading that. Um, so we're going to move on to our next presenter. Um, is, his name is Ernie Silva. He's the Director of External Affairs at SIA Tech, and he is based in Sacramento, California. And SIA Tech, um, which he will tell you lots more about, but it is a multi-state network of um, schools that are working to re-enroll students um, that are at risk of dropping out and uh, those who have already given up. And um, these, these have been putting forth really great strategies to, to guide um, the young folks back to graduation. So I will turn it over to you, Ernie. Thanks, Erica. And I want to thank the Linda Vista uh, community for allowing me to use their Starbucks um, this morning to reach out to you. And I want to thank all of you on the, on the call who are hearing my, my background noise. So I'm Ernie Silva. I work as an advocate for Sciatech, a network of dropout recovery high school. And I also serve as executive director for the Reaching at Promise Student Association, which is a, uh, a, a nonprofit that serves schools, workforce agencies, and community organizations that uh, provide services to the at promise or the opportunity youth uh, population. We're going to look at the next slide. Uh, so, and, and Prince did a great job of kind of talking about uh, who, who it is that we're serving. This is the, often I have to explain this to policymakers or even educators who really, once a student leaves their high school, they're kind of glad that they're done. Um, what we do is we focus on re-engaging the students who have left other uh, high schools, traditional high schools. Um, and the, the piece that I really want to underscore is the, the consideration of trauma and of the the, the, the things that happen to a young person from, and there's a, a great Amy Lansing from UC San Diego that's a great research from the, from the it's kind of from the womb to the tomb. So there's, there's trauma that occurs to the child in utero as well as throughout the, the growing up process. And that really throws young people off. It, and, uh, uh, and so one of the things that uh, is important for schools like mine and community organizations to be doing is to understand that that connection with a, with a caring adult um, that maybe wasn't done at home, that what we're really offering for that uh, is those, are those relationships. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, and, uh, and, and Trent covered that really well, too. So what, when we get to a school that's trying to serve these, these students, um, what we want to do is one build relationships, we want to build trust, and we want to build confidence in the in the students. So this slide just kind of breaks through, breaks down. So we're about half and half men and uh, young men and women, um, but this kind of shows you the rest of the, uh, the the demographic breakdown. But it's it's pretty common. It's it's the students who are uh, disproportionately dropouts, and their schools who uh, who serve the students are serving young men and women of color and particularly uh, high poverty um, populations of young men and women of color from communities that, uh, that uh, where, where joblessness is, is very common, where generational poverty uh, is very common. Let's take a look at the next slide. Um, so I, I want to talk to you just a little bit about uh, what we do as a school and it's, and you know, I'm going to tough and tough and SciTech's a great school and we are, but there are other schools that are doing uh, this work too. And the practices that we use are very common uh, within uh, the, the other schools that serve these kids as well. So one of the big things is we're trying to personalize the learning experience. Students that we serve have had uh, a, a lot of trauma even in school and, and not feeling welcome, not feeling that the, the, the teachers care about them, not feeling that they fit. And so what we try and do is to personalize the learning experience and give them a sense of, of confidence and confidence. Uh, for those of you who maybe heard 
yesterday NPR had that uh, Saul Khan with Khan Academy on. A lot of what they're doing for high-end kids is what we do for opportunity youth. We're providing that same kind of um, education, that same kind of experience. Each kid has an, uh, an individualized learning plan um, where the, we measure a student that comes to us. Typically, the kids are five to six years below grade level. And what we're trying to do is move them up to a high school level um, in a, uh, somewhere between a year and two year period of time. Um, so we have a personalized learning experience, an individualized learning program, and what we do is uh, the, the school is competency-based, which means rather than just come in and sit in 10th grade for nine months and then you're in or out, you've accomplished your habits, we're measuring the students continuously so they can demonstrate their competence. Um, some students are moving faster, some students are moving slower, but each student is moving at their own pace, and we celebrate that, and we, we encourage um, students to, to move along at, at the pace that they are comfortable at. And the other thing I want to mention, the other big picture piece, is relevance. Uh, our students come to us very frustrated with a, the with a high school experience, and the relevance that we provide is uh, providing career training, providing a sense of community, working on community projects, uh, gaining an appreciation of, of social justice, and we also focus on partnerships, and these are partnerships. Our school works with Department of Labor programs, WIOA programs, Job Corps, and, uh, and One Stop Center programs. But we also look for other partnerships in the community where students can get all their needs met, whether it's uh, uh, drug counseling or uh, other, other counseling, uh, whether it's just the, 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 the basics, um, finding food and shelter. Uh, all these are pieces that are really important to, to our students. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, so the other thing that, um, that's important to schools like mine is that we measure the school like we're measuring the students, what's relevant to the student's life, what's relevant to the student's experience. And as, as you may know, the uh, accountability systems that we've put in place for schools across the country uh, don't have a lot of uh, flexibility in them. They don't have a lot of uh, meaningfulness for the schools and the students um, that, that I work with. And so we work really hard uh, to, together with schools like ours to try and make policy weight makers and school districts and the traditional school family understand that something different needs to be done when you're bringing back kids that are over age five or six years below grade level, and that have had a lot of trauma, not only in their lives, but in their experience in public school. Some of those things are up on the, that screen. Uh, we, we talked about alternative graduation rates. I'd love to hammer on that one, because the truth is that because there was a fear that schools were just kind of pushing kids through and not doing a good job of, uh, of working at graduation and lowering standards and all the rest, they developed a a one-size-fits-all graduation rate, a four-year graduation rate, and that's what you're measured on. But schools like mine that serve kids who have been out of school don't fit in that four-year measure, so we have uh, results that make us look like we're, we're graduating a lot fewer schools, uh, a lot fewer students than we are. So, um, so the, the, the whole alternative, the whole accountability system needs to be looked at anew. Um, the, uh, we talked about, again, the, the idea of measuring each student, measuring them individually and understanding what kind of uh, growth they're making. Um, I have, uh, I'm putting in a, a, a plug for a conference that, uh, that we do. It'll be in this year in San Diego, November 15th and 17th. It's the Alternative Accountability Policy Forum. We have over 200 schools, workforce, community organizations that come together and talk about uh, that they network, they talk about uh, best practices, they talk about strategies for serving the opportunity youth population and trying to figure out um, what we can do to, uh, to help the students be, be stronger and more successful moving forward. Uh, so I want to invite you, uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, working with this population and would like to learn what other schools and other states are doing, um, that's, that's, a that's a mechanism. Um, can we go to the next slide? So um, I'm going to get my policy piece in now. 
So I've uh, been working with PolicyLink and a number of other organizations uh, to sponsor ATR 102. It declares August as Opportunity Youth Reengagement Month. Um, there are over in California, there's over 700,000 young people that are out of school and out of work. And less than 5% of those kids are reengaged. The, the, the tragedy here is in California, and I think in most other states, we don't actually have a way to track. We don't keep data. The Department of Ed our Department of Education doesn't keep that data, so they can't um, tell you how many kids are back in. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, someone just asked if you could speak up, please. Oh, yes, I can. Thanks. All right. So, uh, HR 102 calls for the legislature to develop a specific statewide strategy. Co-authors include uh, not only Assemblyman Member Garcia, but also the chair and vice chair of the Education Committee, the Education Committee, the chair of the Latino Caucus, the Office of the Black Caucus, and the chair of the Select Committee on boys and men of color. We've got a great number of legislators who are focused on this problem and want to do more to help. The ACR 102 recognizes it's time to work with dropout recovery schools, community organizations, and workforce development agencies to make sure that we California keeps its promise that the Latino, Black, and other youth living in poverty to participate in California's knowledge-based economy. Uh, so I, I want to encourage all of you to take a look, look it up, ACR 102, uh, we'd love to have letters coming to Senior Member Garcia, um, and we'd love to work with you through August and the rest of the year on events that celebrate the students that we're serving and get the state focused on doing more to serve those kids. Uh, let's go to the next slide, because I think I'm heading out. Um, yep, yeah, so I'm heading out. Uh, Ernie Silva, Sciatech, we delivered fully lost accredited public high school diplomas to over 10,000 young people. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, there's my phone number, there's my email. I want to thank you all for your, your interest and the work that you're doing to support Opportunity Youth as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ernie. Um, that was a great overview of all the work that you are doing through. Um, I think folks need to go on mute, Ernie, and others if you can go on mute. Um, we're still hearing some, great, thank you. Um, that was a great overview of, of this really holistic model of re-engaging um, uh, students, opportunity youth, and really looking to alternative um, strategies outside the traditional school system and, and it was also great information on the policy advocacy work that's occurring at the state level in California. We are now going to move on to our next speaker, um, who is Andrew Moore. Uh, he serves as the Director of Youth and Young Adult Connections at the National League of Cities Institute for Youth Education and Families, based in Washington, D.C. Um, and he focuses on supporting a national network of dropout reengagement centers, and he leads exploration of municipal leadership roles in juvenile justice system reform, and also he does work on connecting children to nature, et cetera. So I will now turn it over to you, Andrew. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, and it's great to be working with the folks at the Alliance, uh, as well as such uh, wonderful thought partners and, and practice leaders as Prince Sada and Ernie. Uh, here to uh, put out a number of perspectives on Opportunity Youth this afternoon. I think we can go, I want to talk a little bit here just to introduce uh, uh, one response that has welled up uh, with a lot of energy and excitement over the past several years uh, to the nationwide crisis of Opportunity Youth. Prince mentioned 21,000 Opportunity Youth in Oakland. That's a a scarily high number for a city that size. Uh, there are larger cities where there are, are 10,000, 15,000 uh, out-of-school youth, um, and and even larger cities where uh, there are many more thousand. Uh, and cumulatively, that's how we get to this recent figure uh, calculated by our colleagues at Measure of America of nearly 4.9 million young people nationwide, uh, and uh, it's it's not just that the the numbers are large, but the as Erica outlined at the outset of today's webinar, that the uh, the problem of uh, disconnection or being out of school and out of work simultaneously uh, is uh, hits different populations in 
really disproportionate ways. Uh, uh, so th that's uh, something important to keep in mind as we think about uh, our responses. And so going from the uh, level of high quality alternative education that Ernie was describing and the way SciTech works and, and offers uh, student-centered learning. Uh, another approach that uh, cities, school districts, uh, workforce boards, community-based organizations have really elevated over the past uh, five, 10 years has been a, sy a systematic local approach to re-engaging young people, particularly in education, but also in uh, employment and support services. So uh, just by way of introduction to what I mean by re-engagement, uh, we talk about five, fulfilling five functions. Uh, so, and so different organizations at times are picking up uh, some of these functions and uh, a new kind of organization has developed in recent years, a re-engagement center or a re-engagement program that uh, takes on all five functions. So one is outreach to the uh, known pool of dropouts or, uh, in best case, an open door to other young people who may not be on a list of recent dropouts but still need a chance to get ba back into education. Uh, the second is, uh, so that's actually at the outreach stage is where the principles of good youth development come into play, that uh, a caring adult is making a substantive connection with the young person, offering them help and support, and uh, bringing them into a process, the next step of which involves assessing both educational needs and, and strengths, as well as psychosocial needs and strengths. So uh, that's it's important to have a uh, some kind of grounding about where the young person is starting from. Then uh, that professional, that, that youth worker, or outreach coach or re-engagement coach called various things in various places uh, makes a referral to a best fit education option or maybe the referral is to the local workforce board for a job training program if what's most important that in that young person's life is is to get to work and then education could follow so then the uh, re-engagement coach is is coming in to play a role to providing support to re-enroll because uh, this process is complicated. Once you're out of school, getting re-enrolled in school is complicated. Although when it's successful, it can benefit not just the young person, but the school district uh, who can claim some per pupil funding from the state. Uh, and the last uh, part, uh, last function of the five functions is really support to stay enrolled uh, for at least a full year after the moment of re-enrollment to keep making progress educationally. So let's move on. Uh, to talk about other aspects of re-engagement. Uh, we definitely want to think about re-engagement ha happening within a broader ecosystem. So if the, if the citywide re-engagement portal or center uh, is, sits at the center, it's working with a number of other players in the ecosystem, uh, providers of paid work and training or social support services or the juvenile justice agency or the local community college. So all of these come into play and, and are uh, critical. And we probably, in, in order to get at this uh, problem of the scale of 4.9 million young people nationally or 21,000 young people in Oakland, all of these uh, entities are going to have to figure out how to uh, identify new resources or realign existing resources to provide more support to more young people. So let's move on. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, one thing that uh, one thing I'm noticing as I look down the list of uh, 100, 100 plus participants in today's webinar is a lot of unfamiliar names, and that's great. Perhaps a lot of you came in through the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color or other uh, other channels. Uh, so I, I did want to note that there are many different uh, driving goals that can serve as the principal reason for a local re-engagement initiative, uh, depending on uh, local policy discussions, local culture, sense of the needs. Uh, so, so in some communities, it might really 
uh, start from a concern about disparities of outcome. In other places, it might be a continuation or a, a next response to a longstanding discussion about increasing the graduation rate and, and decreasing a high dropout rate. Uh, but there are other reasons as well to think about the, uh, the momentum creating power of re-engagement to launch, people toward, uh, launch young people toward uh, positive next steps like uh, uh, community college or other forms of advanced training that, that come with certifications and set them up to uh, uh, bring home family supporting wages. So let's, uh, let's move on and uh, with that context uh, to talk a little bit about this national re-engagement network that has, has come together. It's my privilege to provide support to it and uh, with my uh, uh, colleagues such as uh, Zakia Nazarzai, who's now working for uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti in, in Los Angeles, uh, recently Neil Smith, now Christy Josbury. We've been looking closely, we, we conduct a census each year to say who's getting uh, re-engaged by the 20 or so local sites of the re-engagement network, as well as the two statewide networks in Washington State and Colorado. Uh, so as you can see, consistent with uh, the, uh, well, somewhat consistent or, uh, with the populations that uh, Ernie was talking about in tech schools, you know, the, we're talking about almost two thirds of young people or more than two thirds of the young people getting re-engaged being young people of color. Uh, and so we're, uh, we're in dialogue with these sites about, you know, making sure that they're driving their services to be culturally responsive, culturally competent and, and really effective for uh, the disproportionately large numbers of uh, young people of color who, who get disconnected. Uh, so let's move on, uh, and I think um, uh, I'm going to wrap up with uh, uh, a little bit of discussion uh, about this nation, national reengagement network, uh, which there's an open invitation to participate, even though I sit at uh, a membership organization of cities. Uh, we welcome participants from uh, the youth serving community based organization world. Uh, county agencies, city agencies, school districts, alternative education providers, uh, uh, other educators. So uh, you can you can get a lot more information by going to our website at nlc.org slash reengagement. Uh, we certainly are eager to provide help to get new uh, reengagement efforts going with only 20 sites nationwide and two statewide networks. Uh, the world remains our oyster in terms of new development opportunities. Uh, we're trying to keep the peer learning going through quarterly peer learning calls and sometimes more specialized calls. We gather information and park it uh, on a resource hub uh, on the web so that folks can, uh, you know, borrow and adapt approaches that others have taken in other reengagement programs and centers. And uh, by popular acclaim of the members of the reengagement network, we do get together in person regularly. So, alongside that very important policy focused conference that Ernie was talking about, the Alternative Accountability Policy Forum in November, uh, coming up this December, uh, the uh, reengagement uh, leaders in Tacoma, Washington, and across the state of Washington uh, are, will hold a large meeting. Uh, where we'll, through a discussion session format, we will seek to uh, get conversations and propel more conversations across the Western US about uh, how to do re-engagement more and better. Uh, so for a state like California, where uh, re-engagement programs are uh, few and far between uh, in, in a formal sense and in a citywide sense, this is an opportunity to travel to a place relatively nearby, uh, soak up everything you can learn from what it took to get a statewide reengagement system going in Washington and bring it back home and, and continue to build on the momentum from the resolution that Ernie and others are, are working on. So thanks again for the opportunity. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you so much. Andy, um, that was really informative uh, to learn about 
these um, you know, local re-engagement centers and how that sits in an ecosystem of partners and players that all really have to be at the table um, to, or have to be part of the solution for improving outcomes for opportunity youth. And thank you for sharing all the information about what's happening at the national level and how people can be involved in, in the National Re-Engagement Network. We are now going to move on to our final speaker. Um, her name is Sada Matthew. She is a senior policy associate with the Forum for Youth Investment in Washington, D.C., where she works to strengthen partnerships and improve leadership capacity to provide young people the comprehensive and coordinated supports they need to be successful. So I will pass it over to you, Sada. Thank you, Erica. <clears throat> so Forum, one of the many great things that we get to do with the Forum is manage the Opportunity Youth Network Actually, next slide, please. And we do that in partnership with GAS Inc. and the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions. So, Opportunity Youth Network, or OYN for short, was launched in uh, 2013 and is a national network of foundations, businesses, federal officials, nonprofits, and young people themselves. And these cross sector leaders are really coming together around um, our North Fork. Our goal, um, if you would, of reducing the number of opportunity used by one million over five years. And we do that through a variety of ways, but I think perhaps, perhaps the most pertinent is um, really helping to align related efforts, particularly across sectors and around different issue areas. For the past several years, we've made a real explicit uh, priority and focus to aligning efforts happening in the opportunity use space uh, with those happening in the boys and men of color space. And one of the ways that's manifested is through the creation of a opportunities playbook for reconnecting boys and men of color, which is why I'm so excited that we're here today to have this important conversation. Um, next slide. And since Andy talked a little bit about um, some good national data points, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide and jump right in and talking about the OI and um, BMOC playbook. Um, so as I mentioned, this is one of the ways we've really um, looked to aligning with uh, the work happening in the boys and men of color space. With the momentum and the increased focus and national attention around boys and men of color, we knew that it was um, really particularly important um, in supporting and reconnecting the subpopulation of boys and men of color that are opportunity youth, or as some people call them, disconnected youth. And in doing that, um, and, and, and really engaging boys and men of color that are not employed and not in school, really required a unique set of strategies beyond those targeted at, um, at boys and men of color more broadly. Um, we knew that finding them would look very differently, right? They're not in school, they're not employed, and that's clearly in the definition. Uh, supporting them would look differently. Um, opportunity youth have multiple overlapping needs and often touch multiple systems. Um, and oftentimes these systems are not coordinated, they're siloed and are confusing to navigate. And then we knew that interactions and delivery would also look very different. Um, opportunities, age, opportunity use, age, and life experiences definitely warrant considerable respect. And we knew that these young people um, who've often lived experiences that are well beyond what many adults, older adults have ever faced. Um, and that, that would um, mean that they have rich talent and a wealth of transferable skill sets um, that should be valued and acknowledged. So, um, myself, Thaddeus Ferber here on my team, uh, we did a lit review, we worked with members of the network, um, experts, practitioners, young people themselves, and really um, tried to pull together a set of strategies, resources, um, and promising practices in one place that would be easy to access. Um, for those working in the boys and men of color space um, that they could take on to ensure that they were reaching opportunity use. So the playbook kicks off with a set of cross-cutting uh, strategies and then it's organized by six critical life, um, lifespan milestones. And each section has an overview uh, with information and data sets on boys and men of color that are not in school or not employed. Um, and then in, in relation to that particular milestone or topic, whether it's two generation approaches, fathers of color, community violence, justice, justice involved youth, um, and then really a set of strategies for taking action, both programmatic and policy oriented. And then I think most importantly, links to key organizations and resources for each of those, uh, those strategies. And since the playbook is over 100 pages, um, and Dr. White, Ernie, and Andy, you guys have provided such awesome examples that you actually, that are spotlighted in um, the playbook across the different milestones, particularly three and four, and actually 
maybe even touching in on some of the uh, strategies included in five and six um, around re-engagement centers, trauma-informed care, the school to prison pipeline, um, programmatic elements of success when working with this particular population. I just wanted to share and spend the few minutes that I have to touch on a little sampling of some of the cross-cutting strategies included in the playbook. And you can hit next slide. Um, because opportunity use often require help in multiple aspects of their life, um, putting in place some of these integrated approaches can be a really good way to start, get started. So in particular, I'm gonna quickly highlight and touch on the three strategies in blue. Um, next slide. That's perfect. The first is uh, include disconnected boys and men of color in developing and implementing your strategy. Nothing for us without us, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I hope by the end of this webinar, uh, we all leave and always thinking about the spirit of that mantra, asking ourselves, I think, both professionally and personally, you know, how are we engaging and elevating the voices of young people in our work, particularly boys and men of color? Um, uh, how are we in, in, in embedding that voice every step of the way, whether it's planning, it's program design, outreach, data collection, giving presentations, advocacy, um, and so. If you, have, if you don't have young people readily and actively involved in your work, uh, here's a little cheat sheet for you, three easy ways to incorporate what young people have to say about what they need um, and really what they want to see happen. And so if you see in your top right corner, Opportunity Youth United is an awesome national group, um, solutions-oriented movement of young adults who've experienced poverty and are coming together to really think about how can we create a better um, and inclusive society. The group was created by the National Council of Young Leaders. Um, these are opportunity youth who are alum of opportunity youth serving programs like Public Allies, Youth Build, um, Conservation Corps. And on a national level, OIU, and they're governed by the National Council of Young Leaders, has really been an awesome partner to our network from its inception. And then on a place-based strategy level, um, Opportunity Youth United has created community action teams, also affectionately called CAST. Um, in, in, in a growing number of places. And right now, I believe they're in five places, Chicago, Phoenix, LA, Boston, um, and New Orleans. And they're always looking for a good, strong, strong backbone uh, CBO to help bring and support um, community action teams to other communities. Um, and then they also have a really awesome set of uh, policy recommendations that they've developed and have been really focusing their energy on supporting civic, civic engagement and voter engagement of opportunities in key places. And then to the bottom, um, you'll see the National Youth Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. And this group is coordinated by the Funders Collaborative for Youth Organizing and are made up of anchor networks like Opportunity Youth United, Dignity in Schools Campaign, the Alliance for Educational Justice, uh, the Community Justice Network for Youth, Sons and Brothers. Um, and this group also has an awesome set of policy recommendations and has really established a justice uh, re um, reinvestment framework. So I advise folks to take a look at that. And then just very quickly, I wanted to um, just shine a light on the policy recommendations created by the Movement for Black Lives. I know for most policymakers and maybe even some of the foundation folks on the call, using com community organizing as an approach can be a foreign concept. Um, but I encourage you to take a look at these po uh, this policy platform. It can be an easy way to infuse um, these young leaders' ideas and their feedback and what they want to see happen. Over 25 networks of organizers contributed to that platform. Very comprehensive, breaks down uh, why these pillars are so important, this image that you see, and then it includes a set of policy recommendations at the local, state, and federal level, um, includes, you know, why this particular is important and gives examples of um, promising policy change across the country and groups and networks who are actually working on those specific issues. Next slide, please. And then I'm just going to quickly highlight these next two strategies, which really involve you taking a step back um, and thinking about how this work fits in a broader community and systems level context. First, just very quickly, it's really important to master uh, what funding is coming into your community and what's available um, to leverage uh, to accomplish your goals around with the men of color and disconnected youth. There's a few uh, resources online that outline public funding streams um, that are really geared for opportunity use, and you'll find that in the playbook. And then um, just a plug of how important it is to do a fiscal scan, which is a cross-department budget analyst, anal um, analysis of 
what funding streams are coming into a community. And you'll see in New Orleans, we help the community actually do a fiscal scan specifically for opportunity use. Um, and was extremely helpful in undercovering um, funding streams that could potentially be leveraged that wasn't currently being leveraged for opportunity use in New Orleans. Next slide. And then lastly, um, just, just wanting to highlight the importance of ensuring that there's a mechanism to align efforts um, around disconnected boys and men of color. There's currently um, many existing efforts across the country that are really thinking about how do you better align systems develop comprehensive and coordinated plans for better serving young people, um, and really thinking about how do you connect them in a systemic way to employment and education pathways. Um, if you aren't connected to these groups and they are in your communities, ask and form for community solutions sites, um, performance partnership pilots for disconnected youth, or the Children's Cabinet Network, um, and these are coordinating policy um, bodies. Um, if, if, you, if they're in your community, please connect with them. And if not, there's really a lot of great learnings and exemplars coming out of these groups. And then next slide, um, in particular, I think uh, an important example is really encouraging these groups to make action and strategic community plan for opportunities in boys and men of color. And then I think I'm going to pause there, and if, if we can go to the next slide. You'll see a link at the end. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide um, to the Opportunity Youth Playbook. There's a variety of ways that you can take advantage um, and really pull the wealth of resources that so many groups have been doing for so many years. Um, and so I think I will stop there and leave some room for uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Sada. That was really, really informative. Um, and I just wanted to call attention uh, to two handouts that are being included in this webinar. One is a handout that Ernie had submitted, and then another one is the actual playbook that Sada had submitted. So please check those out. Um, we have just a couple minutes, about seven minutes for questions. And so I'm gonna just start off with, with one that um, we seem to get a couple of different times. And I'm gonna open this up to the panel, whoever would like to jump in. But one of the questions is, can you speak um, specifically to how organizations and, and folks on the ground that are really succeeding and being able to engage um, opportunity youth and work directly with them and empower them and all that, um, folks who are really effective at this, how, how are they um, get, getting, getting this population into their centers, into their programs? What are the approaches that are really working to reach this group? I think we have a lot of people on the line who are working at the local level and would like more information on that. So I'm gonna open it up to the panel. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at that question, uh, which is to say for, for, for me, it's about culturally competent spaces uh, uh, for young people. You know, you have to uh, uh, create a situation that they want to be in. Uh, you know, you gotta recognize that a lot of these youth aren't in jobs and aren't in school because of the kind of environment it is, because of how they feel when they are in it and their self-esteem. And, um, you know, we really have to create an environment in which there are other youth that are like them there. And that's why I think, uh, as I've stated before, like having the youth participate in uh, changing their own outcomes and even engaging with other youth is, is a significant way. I bring youth into my center. A lot of the youth that are in my Determination Black Men's Group, and we've been growing every year, a lot of them are like referrals basically, right? Like people that are coming that say, hey, look, I've been to this program. This is different. This is not a normal nonprofit. This is not the normal thing that you're hearing, and they're not telling you to pull up your pants. And, you know, these kind of, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking anybody, but I'm just saying this, this, is, this is particularly how uh, uh, we come to the work. We have studios set up graphic design, music, film, all of these things set up for the young men to come and do because we know that that's what they like to spend their time doing. Yeah, and I, if I could just compliment what uh, Prince is saying about the uh, making it really good for the young people and really welcoming. Uh, we There's been a lot of conversation in our re-engagement network about continuing to uh, professionalize and refine the, the position and support the position of re-engagement coach. And it's a um, you know, particular orientation for a youth worker, although it's it's in the it's in the grand tradition of, of positive youth development. So, uh, in the reengagement book that I put together last year with 28 people from across the reengagement network, uh, and consistently on our network calls, there's a discussion about this 
this practice of uh, outreach and, and establishing the, the good working relationship uh, on the part of the professionals. Thank you both. Um, another question is, and this is a really interesting one um, that I'm sure could um, solicit a lot of discussion, but just off the top of your head and what resonates most uh, strongly with you, what is the true measure of success for Opportunity Youth? I think a lot of you have really talked very comprehensively and holistically about this population. So what to you is the measure, the true measure of success? for this group. I feel as though I should do some tag teaming with Sada uh, because the Opportunity Youth Network uh, group of uh, organizations grappled with this question and uh, you know we, what we came to was that uh, as an initial contribution we need to launch strategies at a scale sufficient to, uh, in the very short term, re-engage 1 million of those 5 million uh, out of school, out of work youth. So that's a, that's a lot of efforts in parallel in a lot of uh, localities and uh, a lot of different strategies in play and a lot of scaling up of current uh, very small scale activities. Can I can I add something in too? This is Ernie. The, so we we're a, we're a high school. We provide a diploma. We think that's really important. But it's the the measure of success for our students, and many of them don't complete the high school. The measure of success is the ability to participate in the community and to feel confident in the way they carry out the students carry out their lives, whether that's with a diploma, with a good job, with college, or something else. Um, that's, I think, the, the ultimately the measure, is the ability to participate in the community and the ability to feel like you're making a difference. And that can take a lot of different ways, a lot of different measures. That's exactly right. And I think that's what I was going to chime in to both those points. On a macro level for us as a network, establishing that North Star goal, uh, reducing the number of young um, people who are disconnected. Um, and for us, that may manifest in a couple of different ways. Um, we're launching an advocacy campaign that's focused on federal appropriations. And for us, that means we need to push on Congress, right, to have funding and appropriations that at least allows um, 1 million young people to have slots um, for opportunities serving programs. But I think, Ernie, that's exactly right. The, the complementary to that, I think, on the individual level, right, that's going to look very different for each young person um, in terms of what that young person's measure of success and how they enter the door and when they leave. I, I want to thank you all so much. Unfortunately, we're pretty much at the hour, but um, obviously this is a really great group of folks to reach out to. You have their contact information. Please reach out to them um, with your additional questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. There were so many resources that were provided throughout this PowerPoint. You will have access to the presentations um, within 24 hours. And I, I want to give a big thank you to the, the speakers for sharing all of your work and your insight with all of us. And thank you for everyone uh, for joining today, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Hopefully, um, a lot of us will be able to connect in person at future events or conferences. And I wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you so much.